Hi everyone um, and welcome to the first in what we hope is going to be a very inspiring and an exciting series of webinars put on by the Lifescape project. Um, we're really pleased to see you all dialing in and thanks so much for giving us your time uh, this lunchtime. I'd like to just thank up front um, Nikita Smith and Mariam Abbas um, from Clifford Chance who you might be able to see in the panellists um, who along with Sally who's one of the panellists later um, have done so much to pull this event together. Um, if anyone's ever organised an online event, I think it's uh, you'll appreciate how hard it is, and actually, in some ways, is harder than a real life physical event. Um, so it's great that we've managed to to get it all together. Um, so this event is hosted by the Lifescape Project, um, which you'll hear a bit more about from Adam later on the panel. Um, but the Lifescape Project is a relatively new rewilding charity. Uh, it was established from a multidisciplinary team of individuals from Clifford Chance um, and from ACOM and from the University of Cumbria. Um, the beauty of the charity for me, I think, is the passion um, and love, really, that, that each person, and that includes the people who are volunteers, some of whom I think are, are dialed in here today, um, bring to the work. And um, everyone is so devoted to halting the biodiversity uh, crisis that we find ourselves in. And the beauty also is the kind of diver diversity of thought uh, that each person from their different disciplines brings to the charity. So the founders were drawn from so many different fields like uh, ecology uh, and, and Ian and Sally speak from that perspective a bit today, academia, but the perspective they also speak from uh, law, economics, sustainability, um, and as you know, all the volunteers are from those different fields as well. Um, this has already allowed for so much innovation and um, challenge and progress. And I think um, just as in nature from these seeds, great things are growing. Um, the theme of this event series you have dialed in today is rewilding the world and rewilding the mind. Throughout the series, we'll talk about some theoretical concepts like today's event, um, histories and philosophies. Um, and then before moving on to talk more about how those theoretical concepts are playing out in the Lifescape's work in practice. So the next event is on the Natural Capital Laboratory, which is a, a, a rewilding project up in Scotland, um, and that'll be chaired by Emmy Lee, who I can see is dialed in as an attendee here, who's one of the landowners who's generously donated her land and energy <laughs> to making rewilding happen in real life. Um, if anyone can still remember what it feels like in real life. <laughs> we're, we're calling the series The Thoughtscape um, and we really want to get you thinking about some big ideas that underpin everything the charity does. Um, we want you to come away feeling inspired, as I said at the beginning. If you have any questions or thoughts or, or things you, you hear things that you disagree with, then please do use the chat function, use the Q&A function, um, and get a let's get a conversation going about these things, because they're not, I mean, these people who are, you're going to hear from are experts, but um, they're not the final word on, on anything by any means. Um, if the, finally, if you have anything that you want to ask following the event, then there is a Livescape inbox you can use. I'll put it in the chat after this. Um, it's inquiries at livescapeproject.org. So as I said, we're lucky to have three inspiring and expert speakers here today. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes um, and then we'll leave time for questions. Um, I have some questions in reserve just to avoid the kind of tumbleweed, but please, I would rather hear from you and hear what your questions are. So do put them in the question and answer uh, at the side or wherever you can find to put them. Um, I'll introduce the speakers now very briefly, but I'm sure they'll introduce themselves. Um, so in order that you'll hear from them, Sally Hawkins is a trustee of the Lifescape Project and a PhD researcher at the University of Cumbria where she is using interdisciplinary approaches to develop a social ecological framework for rewilding. She's a member of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Commission on Ecosystem Management Rewilding Task Force. And you can see why that is usually abbreviated to IUCN, uh, CEN, Rewilding Task Force, CEM, Rewilding Task Force. Um, so that um, organization has recently developed a globally recognized definition and principles for re rewilding. Um, then you'll hear from Ian Combrey, who is a Professor of Environment and Society at the University of Cumbria. His current interests are focused on public engagement with species reintroductions and rewilding. He is a trustee of the Lifescape Project as well um, and leads the HLF-funded Back on Our Map 
multi-species reintroduction project in South Cumbria. He co-chairs the IUCN CEM rewilding thematic group and has been a member of the IUCN World Commission for Protected Areas since 2016. Um, and then you will finally hear from Adam Eagle, last but not least, who is the CEO of the LifeScape project. He is a qualified lawyer with specialist um, specific expertise in developing legal and financial mechanisms to aid rewilding projects, as well as leading species reintroduction projects. Adam is a member of the IUCN's rewilding thematic group as well, um, an ex external rewilding PhD supervisor for the University of Cumbria and co-author of numerous articles on rewilding published in academic journals. He has also advised multiple NGOs working in the field of wildlife conservation. Um, so now I'll just hand over to Sally to speak. Over to you, Sally. Okay. Um, I think you should see my <laughs> slides changing. Um, so rewilding is a relatively new concept and it's become incredibly popular, especially in the UK. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, uncertainty about what it actually means. Uh, Ian's going to talk a bit more about the work we did with the IUCN Rewilding Thematic Group to try and address this issue. But I'm going to start by giving a very brief history of rewilding to put that work into context. Um, and this history is based on the results of a survey we've uh, ran with rewilding pioneers from around the world. Uh, these people have been influential in the rise and evolution of the concept of rewilding. Uh, the survey was done in 2018. We approached 126 people, all identified by others as being influential. Um, and 60 people responded to the survey, including key figures from the Wildlands Network and Rewilding Institute in North America, Rewilding Europe and Rewilding Britain and ZSL, along with well-known rewilding academics. The majority of respondents were from North America and Europe, but this corresponds to those areas where the concept of rewilding first arose. The survey contained 25 questions, many of them open ended questions where participants were asked to give personal accounts of their experience or understanding of rewilding in the past and how they changed over time. Uh, just trying to move the slide on here. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, I think you can, so I'm going to continue. Um, so to put rewilding into context, we asked participants to describe the circumstances or drivers which gave rise to the concept. The most prominent of these themes was growing awareness of the extinction crisis and the negative impact of human activities on the natural world, leading to, to the development of the Anthropocene theory. Related to this was a growing awareness that traditional conservation practices, especially protected areas and single species focused conservation, were ineffective in conserving non-human species and natural systems. A growing awareness of how ecosystems function also led to acknowledgement that these practices should change, that conservation required a more holistic approach that incorporated habitat and e ecosystem restoration. Two key theories really influenced rewilding. The trophic cascade theory, which emphasizes the role of predators in limiting the density and behavior of species below them in the trophic webs, and theory, the theory of island biogeography. This highlights the increased risk of extinction of species who live on isolated islands, including island-like nature reserves, which are surrounded by highly mod modified anthropogenic landscapes. There's also mention of a growing interest in reconnecting with nature among the general public, especially where there was a decrease in access to natural areas. Um, participants in North America also point to an increase in environmental activism, particularly related to the deep ecology movement. Uh, in both Europe and North America, increasing rural land abandonment created opportunities for spontaneous rewilding and some encouraging stories of natural recolonization, including of predators which demonstrated that what, what could happen if humans left areas to nature. Um, so to show how and when the concept of rewilding spread across the globe, I was able to map the location of each participant against when they first heard of rewilding. During the 80s and early 90s, these were all based in North America and were part of a group of people who were involved in the founding of the Wildlands Network 
These include some key figures like Michael Sule, Reid Noss and John Davis. In the late 1990s, awareness of the concept continued to grow in North America around activities and discussions instigated by the Wildlands Network Group, including publications in their magazine Wild Earth. This includes an article written by Michael Sule and Reid Noss published in 1998 called Rewilding and Biodiversity, Complementary Goals for Conservation. Uh, the seminal paper is seen as giving scientific grounding to the concept of rewilding, providing the ecological argument, emphasizing the restoration and protection of big wilderness and wide ranging large animals, particularly carnivores. This was different to conservation being practiced at the time because it was on a large scale, emphasizing the need to connect protected areas and acknowledging the role of carnivores and other keystone species in regulating ecosystems. They labeled this the three C's of rewilding, cores, corridors, and carnivores. Between 2000 and 2005, there were two key events which began to drive awareness of the concept more globally. The Dutch concept of natuur ontwikkeling, or nature development, which was being practiced at Ostvadersplassen by Frans Vera, and the publication in 2005 of Josh Dullin and colleagues' Pleistocene Rewilding article in Nature. This paper proposed the idea of using ecological surrogates to restore the ecological roles of Pleistocene era species in North America. So, for example, introducing elephants as surrogates for woolly mammoths. The paper was hotly debated at the time, and because the concept was sensational and published in Nature, which has a global readership, it really drove awareness of the concept of rewilding. And for many years following that, uh, people around the world equated rewilding with this concept of introducing ecological surrogates. The remaining participants became aware of the concept between 2006 and 2015. Key events cited here are the founding of Rewilding Europe in 2010, which grew out of the nature development work being done in the Netherlands, and the publication of George Monbiot's book Feral in 2013. So based on these influences, different schools of rewilding developed. Despite the evolution of the term elsewhere, the vast majority of North American participants still subscribe very closely to three C's rewilding. Along with cause corridors and carnivores, they recognize the need to collaborate across disciplines, sectors, and with communities, and to promote more ecocentric values, acknowledging that other species, not just humans, have intrinsic value. Pleistocene rewilding evolved out of the Wildlands Network group, but has had little influence in North America. It's now seen as a thought experiment, but nevertheless had influence in Europe, and especially on islands like Mauritius and Hawaii, where they have introduced ecological surrogates to replace extinct species. But those are very close related, like tortoise species replacing extinct tortoises. In Europe, there's been the emergence of several groups, but these are less distinct and influence each other. As mentioned, um, the re Rewilding Europe evolved out of the work in the Netherlands and has an emphasis on back breeding, reintroducing domestic herbivores like the aurochs, and also on promoting nature-based economies like ecotourism. In the UK, a group associated with the British Association for Nature Conservation established Beyond Conservation, aka the Wildlands Network, some of, some of whom went on to then establish or influence other rewilding organizing Trees for Life, Rewilding Britain, and the Wildlands Research Institute at the University of Leeds. Another group in Spain, led by Henrique Pereira, discussed and wrote about passive rewilding in relation to land abandonment in Europe. Um, so as you can see, the concept can contain a variety of elements dependent on the influences and circumstances. But in terms of the work for the IUCN Rewilding Thematic Group, we were interested in looking for the common ground across these understandings of rewilding. And we found these lay in the long-term aims or intentions. The aims we identified within the survey responses include both ecological and social change. The most prominent of these was that rewilding ultimately seeks to promote a world where non-human nature can be self-sustaining or self-regulating and self-willed, so nature that can be itself and look after itself. A necessity for this is the restoration of ecosystems to the point where they can function without human management, which requires complete food webs 
as well as a reduction in human control over landscapes, or indeed a reduction in the human desire for control. Rewilding also requires and calls for a shift in the human nature relationship. At, at the very least, it requires people to coexist alongside wild nature, which means that people would, it would be able to tolerate uh, the unpredictability or risk that may come with it. Participants also mentioned shifting the human nature relationship from an anthropocentric one to a bio ecocentric one, recognizing the intrinsic value of non human species and processes, but also understanding and valuing interdependencies between and among humans and nature and valuing nature for its role in sustaining our world. Uh, and on that note, I will hand over to Ian. Thanks, Sally. Uh, let me just get my slides. Um, so I'm going to pick up um, and talk a little bit about the role of the IUCN Commission for Ecosystem Management Rewilding Thematic Group, um, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, uh, this group was set up in 2017. Um, it was established mainly to I guess, create common basis for the development and understanding of rewilding, which is quite an ask, I guess, given everything that Sally's just said in, in terms of the different schools and diversity of opinion regarding rewilding, um, and also to provide SEM and, and IUCN with a clear understanding of what rewilding is and how it can link to uh, key um, priority areas for IUCN and SEM conservation work. Um, and also link to um, other areas of SEM um, activities, such as nature-based solutions, ecosystem goods and services, etc. Um, so uh, Sally's kind of just talked through um, much of the background work um, behind the development of rewilding principles. So that survey ability with that principle. So I'm going to. I'm going to kind of leave. I'm not going to say more about that. Um, other than we we took um, we took those ideas as they were as as they were kind of coming through out to workshops and we tested them and we, we refined them um, and, and eventually ended up with the principles as as they are and as I'm about to kind of talk talk to them. Um, so uh, yeah, let me just oh, I'm trying to click on with my uh, with my keyboard, which of course doesn't work. Um, if you're if you're interested in getting more involved, perhaps in the work of the rewilding thematic group, you can find us on the IUCN website uh, on IUCN SEM website, um, and you can also download the principles principles there. Though I'll also say where you can get them um, uh, from some academic papers too. Okay, so we've got uh, we've got a paper coming out in conservation biology. Um, which includes many of the people on the call this afternoon actually as co-authors. So Adam and Sally are on there um, together with many of the kind of key figures that Sally was just talking about who have been um, kind of pioneers uh, in the rewilding movement and all kind of are currently involved in rewilding. So people like uh, Bill Ripple, John Davis, uh, Jens Fenning, um, uh, Dave Foreman, Reed Noss, and of course Michael Sule, who who is is in many respects the kind of, the kind of founding figure for rewilding and for conservation biology, and who sadly died last year. Um, so this paper is just about available. It's certainly available online in a in a draft version. We're just going through the um, uh, the page setting process at the moment. There's also an IUCN briefing note which talks about the principles, and as I just said on the previous slide, you can download them from the from the website. Um, so uh, uh, the, the the rewilding principles um, uh, are, are, are kind of preceded, I guess, by a, a, a new definition of what rewilding actually is. Um, and we can think about rewilding, I guess, as the process of, of restoring native ecosystems following um, uh, human disturbance um, with the aim of creating a complete food web uh, at all trophic levels. Um, and, and with that kind of full tr trophic, um, full trophic levels, you you should end up with a more robust, resilient ecosystem. Um, uh, so that that then becomes sustainable. It becomes resilient to further change. Um, ideally, using biota that would have been present had that disturbance not occurred. Um, so Sally Sally talked a lot about this idea of a kind of paradigm shift, 
and rewilding the 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 um, rewilding minds and hearts as well as rewilding nature. And and what we're talking about with with this definition, I think, or with the principles as well, is essentially a, um, a transformative change in terms of how we relate to nature, how humans relate to the natural world. I think that's 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 absolutely implicit in all that we're saying this afternoon. Um, so with that in mind, we, we, we might think about rewilding then as, uh, as the restoration of functioning native ecosystems, um, complete with fully occupied trophic levels uh, that are nature led um, across a range of landscape scales. And this is perhaps a, an important differentiation between uh, restoration and rewilding. So, so even though restoration and rewilding are essentially kind of part of the same conservation family, um, there are some kind of key differences. And for me, one of the most important differences moving from being uh, human led necessarily, perhaps at the start of a restoration process uh, through to being nature led, which is when rewilding kicks in because all the pieces of the kind of the, the ecosystem jigsaw are in place and it becomes self sustaining. So this idea of moving from human led to nature led is an important, I think, differentiation between restoration and rewilding. Um, so rewilding, with that in mind, rewilding ecosystems should require little or no human intervention management, um, uh, whilst also, of course, recognizing that ecosystems are, are, are dynamic, they're constantly changing. Um, uh, and one of the great kind of fallacies about rewilding is that it's about looking backwards. It's and trying to create an environment for 10 or 15, 30,000 years ago. It's not, that, that, would be, that would be impossible. It's gotta be forward looking. Um, and it's got to build into um, any project the idea that ecosystems are constantly changing and we have to think about that change in relation to a whole bunch of other threats out there, not least of which, of course, is climate change. So, uh, again, I'm clicking the, the keyboard to try to move the slides, so I'll, I'll, have, I'll get this sorted by the time we kind of uh, we finish, but um, I think I've talked through many of these key points already, actually. Um, so I'm going to skip this other than just to say that. Um, I've mentioned already that rewilding is part of the um, conservation family, um, so it links across to a maps across to a whole bunch of other um, approaches and theories and concepts, such as nature based solutions, the CBD ecosystem approach, natural capital, etc. Um, so, on to the rewilding principles. Um, so rewilding utilizes wildlife to restore trophic interactions as 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 principle number one. Um, and sorry, these aren't numbered, but um, if if we just go down with the, the bold as the as the as as the kind of as a principle. So the first one is um, rewilding utilizes wildlife to restore trophic interactions. Um, almost inevitably, this involves translocation of highly interactive species. Um, these are often apex predators. Um, so, you know, it, it, I often say in these kinds of events that um, rewilding is, people think that rewilding is just about large predators and wolves or, or lynx or whatever. It's not, but often um, it's important to look at the role of carnivores um, as highly interactive species within, within an ecosystem. Um, it, it should be about uh, um, connectivity um, and, and, and uh, how we create a matrix of a of conservation with core areas, but with connectivity between and within those core areas and compatible land use um, it is part of that matrix as well. So we bring back the connectivity across across core areas of protection, but also across the all the human stuff that's in the middle of that. Um, it's got to be about local engagement and support. Um, and I think some of the key lessons from rewilding projects that perhaps haven't been so successful is when that engagement and support hasn't hasn't been there. Um, so for me, that's about, or it is about kind of building in local engagement and participation um, right from the start of a project. So you 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 work with the community or communities to develop that project. Okay, let's skip on. Uh, so we've said already it's um, it's about recovery of ecological processes. Um, just to bang home the point, I guess, that it is not about looking back. So whilst it can be important to think about um, reference ecosystems, uh, looking at what has been in the past, it absolutely has to be forward looking. So it's that combination of 
good understanding of that ecosystem and how that ecosystem has perhaps changed over time, but also looking ahead and carrying out a whole bunch of different kinds of modeling to work out what, what might happen in the future and what you need to do from a project management perspective to create an ecosystem which is robust and resilient as it, as it can be. Um, recognizes that ecosystems are dynamic and constantly changing, said this already links to the last point, but of course, looking ahead to many of the threats that we face, um, climate change perhaps is one of the biggest ones, but a whole bunch of other issues as well that are, that are just on the horizon. This time I didn't try the keyboard to skip forward. Um, just talked about this idea of, of climate change, so I'm gonna, not gonna say more about that, but I think um, it's, it's, it's important to note for this uh, principle, um, that rewilding is, should be informed by science and indigenous and local knowledge. So there's a kind of knowledge pluralism. It isn't about prioritizing one kind of knowledge over another. It's about saying that different, different groups, different communities come at this from different perspectives. And actually, if we work together with local and indigenous communities, along with uh, inverted commas scientific experts, we can come up with a, a form of knowledge which can be really helpful in terms of in, informing how a project develops. Um, rewilding should recognize the intrinsic value of all species rather than just the instrumental value. Um, so it's not just what we get out of nature and, and species, um, uh, which is very much a kind of anthropocentric view. It's about the intrinsic value of species, the, the, the idea that they have value in and of themselves. Um, uh, so there's a kind of ethical responsibility, essentially, to, to, for us to, to, um, to value the existence of all species rather than just what, what we get from them. Um, so it's, it starts to move us, I think, from an from a anthropocentric way of looking at the world towards a, a worldview which is perhaps more ecocentric in nature. Um, okay, rewilding is adaptive and development, uh, rewilding is adaptive and dependent on monitoring and feedback. Absolutely critical, particularly when we're talking about um, large scale, uh, longer term projects. Having good monitoring and evaluation data is, is massively important in terms of being able to carry out um, evaluation work and look at the efficacy of practice um, as rewilding uh, kind of shapes different landscapes over, over periods of time. So good monitoring and, and evaluation data is, is critical. And then being able to respond to that data as it comes through so that pr projects can be, um, the, the management of the projects can change over time to reflect um, uh, changing conditions. Um, and finally, for me, this idea that rewilding is, 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 is about transformative change. It's the opportunity for a paradigm shift in terms of, in terms of our existence on the planet and how we relate to other species that we share the planet with. Um, so, you know, in the past, perhaps this was, this was probably the kind of stuff you'd expect from a a bunch of hippies banging on about um, our relationship with the natural world. Um, this, 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 this point, the final um, uh, uh, rewilding principle, is essentially what's just come out in the Das Gupta review, which has come out from the Treasury Department. And Das Gupta says actually very similar things about um, how, as a species, we have to have a paradigm shift in our relationship with the natural world. Okay, I think that's it from me. Um, uh, yes, it is. I'm going to hand over to Adam. Hi, everyone. I'll just quickly check that I've got control of the slides. Looks like I do. Uh, so I'm Adam Eagle. Uh, I'm Lifescape CEO. I think lots of you already know me, but for those of you that don't, um, I'm going to be talking about who we are, who, who is Lifescape, what is Lifescape, what do we do, and how also does that link back to what Ian's been talking about, the IUCN's principles. And I'm going to do this by first talking about our vision and our mission and our goals. And um, so an organizational vision, that's you know, our vision of the world that we want to see, the world that we want to exist. Uh, for us, that's a world that's rich in wild landscapes and um, one which provides a sustainable future for, for life on Earth, essentially. Um, and the, the way that we want to uh, contribute to that world becoming a reality is what we would call our mission. And for us, that's catalyzing the creation, the restoration and the protection of those same wild landscapes. And the way that we'll do that is through pursuing projects which utilize multidisciplinary skills, uh, particularly 
they include science, technology, law, economics and communications, which Lizzie was talking about at, at the very beginning of this um, webinar about how we got to where we are today. Uh, so, you know, in summary, we want to pursue a world that's rich in wild landscapes. And the way that we're going to do that is by executing multidisciplinary projects that catalyze, catalyze the restoration of those landscapes. Um, so moving on, that's still a fairly general statement in terms of working out what we're doing in the world. So we break it down more specifically into doing two things or two areas of work. The first of those is that we will assist with on the ground rewilding work, restoration work by contributing our set of specialist skills that I've just talked about. And secondly, we've also worked to identify five key challenges for rewilding, which we will contribute to tackling through specific projects that will run and those five areas are on this next slide so they're science technology culture economics and law and the those goals and um, the first one is science what we want to see is scientific evidence being generated to support the creation the restoration and protection of, of those wild landscapes that we want to see and particularly we want to make sure that decision makers are actually following that evidence. Um, under technology, we want to see technology being developed out and deployed and employed to enable that creation, restoration and protection of those landscapes. Under culture, um, what we want to see is cultures that actually appreciate, support and promote wild nature in their own landscapes. And that's broken down into not only being the, the value of nature to humans, uh, but also being its intrinsic value. So that you know goes back to some of what Ian was just saying about the, the 10 rewilding principles and the intrinsic value of nature. Under economics, we want to see economic systems coming into place, uh, becoming a reality, which actually promote the creation, restoration and uh, protection of wild landscapes. And finally, under law, we, we just want to see laws that are in place protecting nature, but also enabling and requiring its restoration. And we want those laws to, to be enforced properly. So all of the work that we do, all of the projects that we have ongoing fit into that structure of either one of those five challenges or of projects that, that are doing rewilding on the ground, which will contribute our skills to. So, of course, when, when we talk about catalyzing the restoration of wild landscapes, we are partly talking about rewilding. And for us, that's the rewilding that Ian's just been talking you through um, and the principles that he's been talk talking you through also guide the way that we pursue that work. And uh, as a result, the work that we're doing does align nicely with those rewilding principles. And what I'll do now quickly is just give a few examples of some of our projects in not too much detail and how, how you know, it's clear that they align nicely with the rewilding principles that the IUCN and Ian have pulled together. I just need to move on to the next slide. So the first of those projects is our natural capital laboratory, which is uh, in its more basic form. It's a, a 100 acre site, which we're rewilding along with the landowners in Scotland. But it's also a physical and virtual laboratory for testing and developing technology and science, which supports rewilding or demonstrates rewilding its impact. And you'll see on the slide here that, you know, we have multiple sub projects going on within that laboratory, different things that we're testing and trialing. So we have digital natural capital accounts, which help us to, or allow us to value nature and the services that rewilding is providing. We have, uh, as another example, eDNA monitoring, which is testing out new approaches to measuring the presence of nature. We have um, a virtual reality platform that's being developed to allow people to engage with what the site might look and feel like in say 100 years once the rewilding process has progressed further and we have an um, ai habitat assessments and other biodiversity monitoring total biodiversity monitoring which is aimed at increasing the accuracy of biodiversity monitoring and the monitoring of species but also reducing the cost of doing that over large landscapes like the landscapes where people um, are trying to rewild. So 
you can see that that project fits in with the goals that I've talked about and it fits in with science, technology, culture and economics. Um, but it also links in directly with a number of the principles that Ian's just talked us through. So you know, particularly the, the first principle, um, which is ensuring full trophic interactions in an ecosystem. Uh, the Natural Capital Laboratory fits in with that principle because the, the, we're doing studies at the moment of the species that are missing from that landscape, including specifically looking for those keystone species that would enable trophic interactions. Um, it also fits in with the seventh principle because we're working to ensure that all of the work we're doing on site, but also rewilding far beyond our site is informed by good science. And we're doing that both through how we're pursuing the rewilding on the site, but, but critically through developing out new approaches and, and running new studies on the site to better understand the impacts of rewilding. And uh, another example of a principle that fits in with really well is, is the ninth principle that Ian spoke about, which is ensuring that monitoring, monitoring and feedback is used in rewilding projects. So both you know, the biodiversity monitoring work and the natural capital accounting allows us uh, to look at the results of the rewilding as it proceeds and to feed those back into decisions that we make about what interventions, if any, we need to make to support the recovery of the ecosystem. So I, I could talk about the NCL for hours because it's a vast project that's doing so much, um, but I won't um, because actually I think it's, it's the subject matter of our next webinar. So hopefully that's just enough as a teaser to get you interested to join the next webinar. Um, I'll move on quickly to another example of a project and how it fits in with the rewilding principles that Ian was talking about. So this project is um, primarily under our legal goal. It's litigation that we're working on with um, Trees for Life to, to ensure Nature Scott follows the law with regard to protecting beavers as a protected species in Scotland. Uh, so currently Nature Scott, uh, which is the responsible nature conservation body under the Scottish Government, has a policy to adopt lethal control, so culling essentially, of beavers wherever they pose issues to particular types of agriculture. And we are supporting Trees for Life on a judicial review in the courts to challenge that position. Uh, so we're seeking enforcement of the laws that are already in place to protect species that include the beaver. But we're also using science alongside that law to demonstrate that lethal control is the wrong policy and it's not the only way to avoid impacts on farmers and instead actually alternative measures like removal of dams which can cause issues or the translocation of beavers uh, would be uh, to, to areas which are lower conflict which aren't maybe the same type of agricultural land would be much more sensible um, solutions so you can see that fits again under our goals of law and science but more interestingly it fits under the IUCN's principles as well even though it's quite a diverse project from the first that we discussed. So particularly the first principle, um, ensuring the beaver isn't lethal, lethally controlled and is present as far as possible in Scotland um, is, is about restoring and maintaining trophic interactions because beavers are a keystone species. And you know, I won't go into the detail, but they create entirely new habitats through their damming activities, which um, you know, support a wealth of other species in the ecosystem. It also aligns with the second principle, because uh, in trying in bringing this legal action, we're trying to ensure that coexistence with nature is the default approach in Scotland, rather than the elimination of nature, which is the current approach taken by Nature Scott with regard to beavers. And it also fits into the tenth principle, which is you'll remember the paradigm shift that Ian talked about, because in this case, we're essentially trying to make a shift in the way that the government views its its relationship and its stakeholders relationships with wildlife to one where there's an acceptance of its value um, instead of you know using anthropocentric approaches to deal with the problem i.e simply eliminating beavers um, so i'll just move on from that second example to a final example which is the wild side project which is a platform that we have developed for crowdsource information about how, when and where to connect with wildlife anywhere in the world. It's essentially a website that can be accessed by users to facilitate interactions with wildlife. And our hope is that this can 
help to create a step change in the amount of money that's being spent on wildlife watching and generate a local economic necessity to protect the natural environment where people are coming to areas to engage with the natural environment. Um, so you can see that, that that goes to our technology and our culture and our economics goals. But again, even this, again, quite a different project links back to the IUCN's principles for rewilding. It links back to the second, which is again, coexistence. We're promoting a healthier, closer relationship with nature, which will facilitate coexistence with it. It links back to local support because it's generating economic advantages for supporting rewilding in local communities. Um, and it also links back to the eighth principle, which talks about the intrinsic value of nature. Because we're trying to build a community of people that have this appreciation of nature um, across the user base of the website and that have an appreciation of it in a way that goes beyond the, the use it might have to them um, at a deeper level by facilitating the interactions that they can have with nature. Um, so I'll stop there. I think that's quite enough from me for now. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Lizzie, who's going to lead a discussion of the issues that we've all been covering today. Uh, so hopefully everyone can get involved in that and ask some questions. So thanks, Lizzie. Thanks. Adam, and thanks everybody for speaking. Um, it's been really fascinating um, to hear from you all and to hear right from the history, right to where we are now and why why uh, you're doing what you're doing. Um, I, I, Ian, if you wouldn't mind coming back on camera um, so you can't shirk answering the questions, you can, you can have you. Um, I, I'm going to start with something uh, just to, to hear a bit more about the panellists, if you don't mind. I was just uh, reflecting on your bunch of hippies comment, Ian, and wondering whether you would class yourselves panellists as a bunch of hippies and what is it that's brought you to to really, so in seriousness, what's, what is it that's brought you to this? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why do you care about rewilding? Um, who wants to go first? I'll give you, Adam, you, you I, move. I, I, I can go first. Um, <laughs> I don't think that I'm a hippie. Um, <laughs> so my background is as a commercial litigator, originally at Clifford Chance. So I think that classifies me as almost certainly not a hippie, not not 100 percent certainly, but I think most likely not a hippie. Um, and I, I mean, I came to I came to this subject because I was inspired by the positive message of rewilding. So traditional conservation is about um, you know, limiting, reducing um, the amount of damage we're doing to nature and protecting what's left. But rewilding gives us a vision for the, the future that's really positive. It's about the ability to allow nature to come back and even to let it do it itself of its of its own volition um, wherever possible. So I think it's the positive message. And then just personally, having been to some wild landscapes, I've been incredibly lucky to have been to them. And, um, you know, I felt that I've connected with them in the same way, I guess, like I was talking about on the wild side project. That's something we want to see more people get to do, have this deep connection with wild landscapes and feel kind of, I don't know, for me, it was almost a feeling of being small within this wild landscape and being you know, subject to the power of something much greater and um, just inspires me, inspired me at the time and, and makes me want to work on these issues. Well, what's your, what's your favourite wild landscape you've been to? That's difficult. Um, I was very lucky during a short sabbatical to get to go to Patagonia and some of the national parks there, like the Tompkins Conservation's Patagonia National Park, which is an interesting story probably for another day in itself um, was incredible. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good choice, good choice. Um, Ian, would you like to go next? Why are you, why are you doing what you're doing? Uh, yeah, I'm a fully paired up hippie, um, so uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to embrace that. But I think, you know, if we've got, um, if we've got Partha Dasgupta writing a report for the Treasury, talking about the need to have a different relationship with the natural world to to and I paraphrase to become more ecocentric in in the way that we relate to the natural world I think the hippies are starting to take over um, which is a good thing I think actually in in many respects um so uh yeah but you know there's 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 a bunch of work to do obviously and I think what we didn't talk through what presentation I guess is the dire state of nature at the moment I mean it's not just one report or bit of evidence that tells us that it's it's across the board whether it's um, state of nature report um, uh, living planet index the IPBS survey all pointing towards 
uh, what could be catastrophic collapse of various ecosystems around the world. So, um, it, you know, it's we, we we face we face biodiversity collapse. Um, so, it, and it's very easy just to just to get um, to to feel like there's nothing you can do. And there is, you know, and, and and there is a lot of doom and gloom, I think, around that. So for, for me, what rewilding does is actually offer a more optimistic vision um, for how we can change that relationship. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, 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 we can still do stuff. We can still make it better. And I think rewilding, you know, we can't rewild everywhere. Um, that would be, that would be impossible and stupid. Um, but I think rewilding as part of the conservation toolkit is potentially really important in terms of, uh, how how we get out of our current predicament and how we 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 restore biodiversity. What was the question? Yeah. <laughs> Did that, answer it? that was a great answer. I think it's it is really important to kind of look back, isn't it, to, to the biodiversity crisis because we haven't talked about that here. But mm -hmm. um, obviously, they could do you could do a whole talk about that. But it, it, I think ultimately, you know, everybody here is probably doing it for that purpose to to halt that. Um, Sally, would you like to, to yes. when did you start? <laughs> so um, I grew up in South Africa and um, I think at the time didn't realise how lucky I was to live in a place where humans and nature interacted um, just in everyday life um, until I moved to the UK and lived in London for 10 years. <laughs> and, um, uh, and that's when I became more interested in kind of restoring nature but also natural experiences I think it's so important for for culture to be able to interact and just and have wild nature around us um in part of our cities I mean the city I grew up in East London there are you know it's just very wild we have monkeys coming into our house <laughs> um, um but yeah so uh I think as well just picking up on Ian's point that it's an optimistic vision you know I think uh, moving away from that doom and gloom message that um, that the world is ending and and we can't do anything about it, but we we can. I'm just trying to be pragmatic about moving forward. But yes, I'm, I'm a complex human with the hippie tendencies. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You didn't all have to actually answer the hippies. This has gone on record now, though. So. You can... <laughs> Um, so we have got a couple of questions coming, which is fantastic. Um, please do keep them coming. I'll try and uh, keep track of them all. Um, so there's a couple of questions that are probably linked here. So um, Lawrence and Alex Eagle asks, what is the minimum scale slash area at which effective rewilding can be delivered based on the outlined rewilding principles? Um, anybody want to take that question? Um, Ian, I'll send it towards it. Ian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, ha happy to do that. My, I, I, it, it's it's um, it's not copying out from answering the question, but it, uh, I guess that the response to that is always, well, it depends um, because rewilding is always kind of temporally, spatially, and ecologically specific. So it's about looking at what's the right fit for this place at this point in time, given what we know about that ecosystem. And given what the modelling uh, tells us, how that ecosystem might change over time. So, um, and it's then thinking about that change within that kind of that matrix of land use um, that I talked about earlier. So we've got that co coexistence with um, all the human stuff, whether that's um, uh, agriculture or settlement or whatever else, uh, alongside the wild nature. So we move a little bit more towards the kind of situation that Sally was describing, actually, where we become. We, we we become comfortable uh, with coexisting with with wild nature, um, so it's um, it it's always contingent. I mean, there isn't a blueprint or a magic bullet for rewilding. It's about looking at what's the right fit for a particular place at a particular point in time. Um, yeah. Does that does that answer the question? I'm not sure if it does. Sally, do you want to chip in? Uh, just to just to add that um, that rewilding is a long term kind of uh, process and so and it's not an exclusive process either so if anybody is interested in re doing rewilding it would just be about asking the question what can we do here and now based on the resources that we have to to try and promote that um kind of trajectory towards uh, a, a landscape where we have wild nature coexist um, humans coexisting um uh, in the long term, though, we will, 
kind of need to look towards connecting up areas of uh, within the landscape. That's where um, all those processes can happen freely. Yeah. I mean, maybe just to very quickly add to that before Adam comes in, um, Tony, Tony Sinclair, the sort of famous ecologist, would probably say if he was on the call, look, rewilding can't be everywhere. If it was everywhere, it wouldn't be special. It wouldn't be rewilding. It's about how it fits into other approaches and other ways in which we can use the land, but also tackle biodiversity crisis. So it's, it's about rewilding being part of the toolkit, but as Sally suggests, taking that longer term bigger scale vision as well. So you get that kind of integrated approach, spatially, but temporarily too. Mm, yeah. Adam, do you want to come in on that question or, or are you? No, that, I think that's said a lot on it, so. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, actually something that you finished on there, Sally, links to one of the other questions that's been put in the um, chat from Emmy Lease, um, which is about a lot of a lot of you in your talks have used the language of coexisting with nature. But Sally, I, I noticed you did touch a bit on the deep ecology origins. Um, do you think that that language uh, is is symptomatic of how we've evolved as a modern society to see ourselves as kind of separate from nature rather than as part of it? Or, or is that a deliberate choice to use that language? I think it's a, well, it's a deliberate choice to use the language because it's a quite pragmatic approach because, well, in certain cultures anyway, I mean, the re rewilding has kind of evolved in North America and Western Europe where people do use terms like ecosystem and don't include humans within that, the definition of ecosystem. So it's kind of a pro pragmatic use of the language, but also I think it's it just raises a very good point that we need to be wary of how we use that language because there are cultures in out there where that concept of humans and nature being separate um is, is not yeah compatible mm. and adam you must be thinking about all these things in forming a charity and, and building a charity and what kind of language you use and how we position how the charity positions itself do you do you have any thoughts about that yeah, so I mean, I think it's it's fair to say that it's to some extent symptomatic of how we've evolved as a modern society, and there is a, di a bit of a dichotomy between, um, you know, seeing ourselves as entirely separate in that wording, um, and what we're saying, um, which is that actually we are part of nature and we need to live with it. Um, so a sustainable future for life on Earth is part of our vision, and that's you know, that's there to help talk to this point, I suppose, in a, in a fairly simple way, but, you know, we, we see our ultimate objective as um, a sustainable future for life on Earth, and we're specifically included in that statement. So humans are part of that life on Earth, and so are all other species. So, yeah, I think, I think there's, all, there's a tension there. It's also partly about, you know, finding ways to communicate with the people that we're trying to communicate with in, in terms that they'll understand. And I think that's probably part of the reason for the language of coexisting with nature and um, yeah hopefully that partly answers the question yeah the beauty of these things you don't really need to answer the question you just need to say some interesting things and then... <laughs> <laughs> no, but that does answer, it does answer the question Ian, would just, you like uh, to comment on that yeah sorry lizzie yeah i, I think um, what we didn't talk to as well because we didn't really have time was that in in um, coming up with the new definition and the rewilding principles, we also reconfigured the three C's. So Sally talked about the, the three C's as developed by Michael Soule as car, uh, core areas, carnivores and connectivity. Uh, we, we're now talking about core areas, connectivity and coexistence, which isn't to say that carnivores are, aren't important. They're critically important for all the reasons that we outlined in the talk, but I think we're, we're at a different point in time. And I think coexistence is really fundamental to, to how we address a whole bunch of problems and we bring back that connection to nature. Um, certainly in a kind of Western European, North American view anyway, uh, we've, we've, we've become disconnected. And that, you know, that's, that is a whole webinar in itself as well in terms of what that means. But, I, but you know, that, so let's just leave it at that for the moment. But I think coexistence is pivotal. Mm. It's funny, isn't it? Because um, in that question about why you're doing this, we, we've had those discussions kind of, you know, in the days when we could go to pubs around a pub table. And it's often that somebody's had a 
a deep a, a, a kind of almost spiritual experience in nature in that you know as adam said there he's been to the wildest places on earth and and you kind of and I, so there it's coexistence but there is something that strikes isn't there somewhere in uh i think there is and you know what we didn't talk about and what what sally kind of touched on a little bit was the more philosophical strand to rewilding so the work of people like Peter Taylor in the UK context, but Mark Beckoff in the US kind of North American context, coming at rewilding from a different perspective than perhaps Michael Sula and Reed Noss, but still as important in terms of just giving a different a different take on what it means to rewild, but but in, in their work kind of rewilding ourselves and rewilding our relationship with the natural world. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. I think at this and um, it's so important to look beyond our Western European, North American perspectives to cultures that do coexist and who do value nature for their intrinsic value. Um, yeah. Yeah. On that, there is a question um, actually in the chat that's, that's related. So, um, how do you uh, align the re-establishment of Complete, complete trophic webs with local stakeholders who maybe have an interest in maintaining current land uses, which might not be uh, to give it over to nature. Sally, you don't have to go <laughs> first, even though you're on the screen. Um, Ian, could I ask you to 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 comment on that? Yeah, sure. well, it's the easy one. Do you okay. want to go, Sally? <laughs> go on, you go. Um, just with sensitivity, I suppose this would be the yeah. the answer to. To that, uh, there's been history in the past with c conservation biology of people going in from outside a community and trying to impose their perspectives, and and that's led to some issues. Um, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be bold in trying to change culture from from inside, especially within the UK, for example. Like the Lake District National Park is quite. Um, an anthropogenic landscape and trying to try and reintroduce some wildlife into that is is you know we come up with um some negative um yeah negativity towards wildlife in the lake district and you can talk more to that i think oh you know it's my pet subject it's a, it's a biodiversity <laughs> desert you've been way too kind to the lake district there, Sally. politically um, correct i think <laughs> Uh, I mean, we were we were asked to to pull together a rewilding briefing note for the ICN, and as part of that, we we commented on, or we were asked to comment on, um, rewilding projects that have perhaps alienated local communities. And so we did that without mentioning names. But there's countless examples in rewilding, but conservation more generally, I think, where projects have been set up and developed with a whole set of good intentions, but they haven't been able to work with communities. And, and what you end up with is a failed project most of the time because you just don't get that community buy-in, which is absolutely essential. The ev all the evidence suggests that it's essential to get community engagement if that project is is going to is going to live beyond what is usually a kind of four or five year project cycle. So it's fundamentally important that that is the case. And I suppose to answer the question, um, it, it, you know, not to keep saying it, rewilding isn't about everywhere, but rewilding isn't about everywhere, but it's about how you get that connectivity. So if you can make a farmed landscape just a little bit more wilder, so you create some corridors and they're perhaps just corridors for invertebrates or small mammals. Um, but if you can start to bring that connectivity into a landscape, then it, it, it enables you to, to to take that kind of more networked approach and to think about how it all kind of fits together. So um, I think, as Sally said, it's about working with different groups and whether they're farmers or people working on grass moors or wherever else, just to, to try to kind of develop, co-develop a more joined up approach to landscape management. And I'm going to shut up now and hand over to Adam. <laughs> No, it's, it's fascinating, Ian. I think it's the joined up, and it seems like that. I don't know from um, I'm an amateur enthusiast in these things, but it seems like that is growing in the UK, in particular in the UK context. The idea of uh, having a, a connected section of different lands. Um, Adam, do you want to speak to that? I was going to. Well, I think you. we've got quite a few questions coming in that we've not got to so far, so it might be better if we jump on to another one. I, I can see Stephen's asked probably two. Um, so maybe one from Stephen we could pick. 
Yeah, that one, that one was one of those ones was from Stephen, but I can. Uh, oh, okay. No, is it? Uh, it's uh, um, um, more question is the better. I think is is the is the thing. Um. So yeah, Adam, one that might be that is linked to that. I think that that might be for you. Um. Is is Stephen's asked about the the perception of rewilding in the UK? So so Sally and Ian touched on it on it a bit. Do you think there is appetite for rewilding, and and is that everywhere amongst everyone or is it um no it's it, it's definitely not everywhere amongst everyone um i think you know in part of the one of the same questions or a related question um someone i think it's stephen is talking about you know, the the use and the caution regarding use of the term rewilding by different organizations i think from our perspective we'll use it where we think it's appropriate and where it's the thing that we think can solve the issues that we collectively want to solve and can help us restore um, protect or create wild landscapes, um, but there'll certainly be cases where that isn't the right approach, where caution is warranted. Um, it, it also goes to another question I saw actually, which was about um, where it's not appropriate uh, to use rewilding if you're managing to protect a specific species, which I've typed an answer to. But you know, similar point there that it doesn't. It's not one size fits all. Maybe that rewilding can't solve that problem in the short term, but in the very long term, it could. Um, but I am meandering off the original topic, so I'll go back to it now. Um, yeah, so not not in every case. Certainly not everyone is going to support it. There are clearly people um, who are very opposed to the concept of rewilding because of part of the, the narrative that's come alongside it over the past decade. And, um, you know, that can't be avoided, it's true. Um, but I also think there's a lot of support from large parts of the population for rewilding. And as a result, we're absolutely warranted in in exploring it and pursuing it where it does fit and where we can work with local stakeholders who would be impacted by it in a way that's positive for everyone um, and in a way that ultimately allows us to to restore landscapes wild landscapes so i don't know if either of ian or sally want to chip in on that uh just to highlight again that kind of long-term goals of rewilding and it might not even be appropriate sometimes to approach a community or landowners with the term rewilding. It's just, it's about trying to create potential over the long term to get to, to, to achieve those aims. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it might not be, so for example, you know, reintroducing links right now might not be in the UK right now, might not be the right approach, but how, what do we need to do to get to the point where it is okay and that might meet, be in a hundred years time who knows but, <laughs> but yeah <Hope> it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I guess i'm going to use my chair's privilege there on that point so you you mentioned reintroducing links is if you had a magic wand and you you know you've done all the the community engagement and people are back behind it what are you what are you what are you introducing what are you rewilding in the uk <laughs> well if if, as you've said, if it were true that everyone were behind it, um, then, you know, I'd certainly be, be looking at reintroducing the Eurasian links um, as an apex predator where it's likely that there's sufficient habitat for it to do well with some additional conservation management. Um, it's a charismatic species. It could get lots more people really engaged with wildlife in the UK, really excited about it. Help from the perspective of the wild side project, which I talked about a bit, you know, creating that attitude towards wildlife that's really positive, making people wildlife uh, value wildlife more, um, and they're thereby supporting the restoration of wildlife and and um, of ecosystems. So yeah, the Eurasian links would seem like a really interesting one. Um, I'll hand over to the other two because I'm sure there's lots of other species that I could keep going on about more, but I won't hog the time. Um. Yeah, I, I, just to very quickly go back to the last question, which is, I think it's the re bit of rewilding, which often is very problematic. And, you know, would we use a different word to describe it now? Does it matter? Would we go with wilding? In some respects, the the um, it's it's just out there and we have to live with it and whether we can rehabilitate the word for want of a better term or not, I don't know, but I think it, 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 it does come with baggage. Um, in terms of what what we do in a UK context, I mean it's got to be it's got to be ecosystem driven. But if you look at the IUCN guidelines for translocations, it's also got to be socially 
um, and to some extent economically driven as well. So it's about just finding that sweet spot where um, ecologically it makes sense, socially it makes sense, and economically, politically it makes sense too. So, um, and and for me, whilst the ecology is, you know, the, the the key the thing that should drive that, we have to be. We have to work with the other stuff as well, whether that's the working with communities, working with social contexts, or working in a kind of uh, economic political context too. So, um, you know, links, <laughs> links seems like an obvious one, I think. Um, you know, <laughs> along with all the caveats that Adam said. Yeah, I've taken the obvious one, Ian. You've got to uh, state your claim somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we should leave wolves to another call because that could be that could be that could be a whole webinar in itself. Whether wolves would be a good fit at some point in time for for the UK, um, fascinating. Uh, and there's lots of reasons why it could and why it could not. Why it maybe wouldn't work. But just to add to the point about links or, or any reintroduction of um, carnivores in the UK, <laughs> um, you know that they have shown in studies that where people coexist with apex predators, they're, they're actually more tolerant of them as well and more adaptable. Um, and just, you know, from growing up, my, my experience of growing up in South Africa, where you do adapt and you do just learn to tolerate um, other species coming into your home, for example, snakes and spiders. And, um, you know, we, we're in this country, uh, things are less to tolerable. Um, so, you know, maybe that's uh, kind of shows the potential for reintroduction to actually make people realize that coexistence is possible. Yeah, thank, thanks. Thanks very, very much. And you didn't commit to anything either, Sally. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Just yeah. to say, I didn't commit to wolves, Lizzie. Okay. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Shut you down to wolves. And as I say, it's been recorded. So. <laughs> um, Great, thanks everyone. Um, we've got another question here um, from from somebody who's attending um, who says, thank you very much for an interesting talk. Um, on the topic of people coexisting with nature, can people ever be considered ecosystem engineers um, who contribute towards uh, ecosystem function? For example, where human activities replace the function of species, which um, for whatever reason can't be reintroduced. For example, vegetation management in nature reserves, which aren't suitable for large herbivores. Where some of the functions in an ecosystem are carried out by people, does that still count as rewilding? Um, I think it just it, so it goes back to some of the what we were talking about in the previous question about um, how ecosystems and humans are seen as separate. Um, I think I'd I'd like to see a, a time where humans are considered to be ecological actors, um, not at the top of the food chain, but like. But we have influence on ecosystems, certainly. Um, I think for rewilding, the ideal would be for an ecosystem to manage or for people, what people really want to see is nature flourishing and nature being able to self regulate. Um, so, can humans step in? Yes, of course they can. Um, but is that what we really want? I suppose would be the question. Uh, and is it rewilding? I guess. And, and there's, you know, there's a spectrum. From you know full rewilding, complete nature-led processes, and um, all the way you know on the one side, all the way to human management of ecosystems on the other end. And I think that that that, that description just falls somewhere on that spectrum. Uh, so you might not say it's the purest form of rewilding, but um, you know it, it's potentially capable of doing really good things in in the right sites where where rewilding might not be feasible. Yeah, and and I, you know. And to perceive humans as um, we can influence ecosystems, of course we can, but it's that where do you draw the line and where do you use, kind of get to the point where humans are actually controlling an ecosystem? Mm. So is is there baggage with the term rewilding? And is it a massive debate about, um, you know, you're saying, Adam, there's a, there's a, um, is that really rewilding? Do, do you think that people are, are fighting over that term? And is that a mistake? Um, I think that what's described there is ecosystem management. So I'm not sure that there's a necessarily a, needs to be a big debate there. Um, you know, rewilding is a nature-led process, and the description, you know, 
you know, might, we can term it as humans as ecosystem engineers, but we can also term it as um, human management of ecosystems for con conservation purposes, which is kind of what that question I think describes. So from my perspective, there's not necessarily a big argument between those two positions. They're just, for me, they're different things. Um, but maybe that's me covering up an argument that there is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things we, we, um, we uh, sort of chew over in the rewilding thematic group is this idea of a rewilding continuum, which talks to, I suppose, how we move from a more human modified landscape, um, whether that's degrees of ur urbanness or humanness um, towards a more um, a wilder landscape. Um, uh, we, we talk about pristine wilderness, whether that exists or not is, is, a, is a point for discussion, I guess. Um, so within that, you've got increasing levels of anthrop anthropogenic modification. You've got increasing evidence of human intervention in that landscape. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's again, it's about that, that kind of mix of landscape approaches. It's about that connectivity and a more integrated approach so that you can see how you can move from perhaps a process of re remediation through rehabilitation through to restoration perhaps then through to rewilding if that's the right use for that for that land um uh so it's it's about looking at it uh, across the piece essentially and you know this idea of nature needs half i think is really interesting off the planet we, we give up to to biodiversity in nature some really fascinating questions then about what happens in that half that we give over to nature um is it do we, is it about being completely having humans completely removed from that space? Is it about some kind of limited level of human intervention? Does that fifty percent become all protected areas? In which case, what kind of protected area is it? Um, I guess to respond to the question, there's some really good examples of where for for millennia humans have coexisted with nature uh, in a in a landscape which has been modified by nature but but by humans as well. Um, so one of the good examples of this, I guess, is the Serengeti and Maasai movement with livestock uh, uh, over time and how that interacts with wild nature. But of course, those systems are in depression now for a whole bunch of reasons, kind of population change. Um, in, in With the example of the Serengeti, um, uh, uh, some settled agriculture as part of that. So it, the systems that perhaps were sustainable in the past are, are becoming less sustainable now. Um, so, Lizzie, where the hell am I going with this? Have I answered the question? <laughs> no, that was, that was definitely an answer to the question. Thanks, Ian. Um, on that point at the end there, so the, there's another question um, in the in the chat, which is, um, have you got have you got shining examples that you would that stand out for you as success stories of rewilding? Uh, in in the North America, a lot of um... Uh, people within the survey and who we've um, dealt with it during the consultation process talked about the Yellowstone to Yukon, Yukon project. So that's a, a very large landscape scale um, project based on trying to connect up uh, different protected areas within um, uh, so the Western North America. Um, and that seems to have a lot of successes. Uh, do you want me to go? I, I would probably talk um, again in an American context. I would talk about um, uh, in South America, talk about um, Tompkins conservation and their work in Ch uh, Chile and Patagonia. Um, for me, it ticks kind of most of the re rewilding principles box boxes. Um, it's about the three C's of connectivity, coherence, and coexistence. Um, they spent a lot of time building trust with local communities and local farming communities. They set up a network of, of, um, uh, of core areas of protection that will eventually be handed back to the Chilean government as, as national parks. Um, it's large scale, multi-site. Um, uh, it's about reintroduction of a range of species, not just carnivores, but a range of other species as well. Um, and the idea is that over time it, it functions without human intervention, but also offers some economic opportunity to local communities in, in, in certain areas. Uh, so that it, it 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 really is a it's it's one of the best examples I think kind of globally of where rewilding is is really working well. Mm. Is, mm. Um, is that where, where you were talking about having been, Adam? Yes, yeah, and I was going to give a very similar answer, but but so that we got something in your Euro European context, I think that there's lots of great work going on, but something um, which I think has got lots of potential is 
a fairly new project, which is called the East West Wild Project, which is one of Trees for Life's initiatives, and um, which is a, a vast area of the Highlands in Scotland, uh, spanning from the east shore of Loch Ness across um, all the way to the, the coast in the west. And, um, you know, that is of a scale that's got real potential uh, to have, you know, huge positive impacts and connectivity between multiple different kind of nodes, which are more heavily protected and larger, uh, especially in the UK context where, you know, land availability is lower and it's harder to achieve larger projects. They're working over a scale that they, you know, by no means have control over this area of land, but are seeking to work with those that do to, uh, you know, promote rewilding, but promote the restoration of nature more generally. So I think it's got a lot of potential, that project, and so we'll be watching it closely. Mm. Uh, and just to mention something that's actually not an official project, but there have been real uh, stories of passive rewilding, so uh, spontaneous yeah. rewilding happening in Western Europe, you know, for example, the um, recovery of wolves in Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, mixed success because they obviously come into conflict with with uh, human landscape and human land uses. Um, but it just shows that there's been this um, recovery of habitat that is acceptable for wolves. Yeah. Uh, across, I mean, multiple parts of Europe, including the Mediterranean, there's land abandonment that's resulting in spontaneous rewilding, uh, which is entirely nature led, uh, which is you know, a really interesting phenomenon that's had a, a significant positive impact from a, a nature conservation perspective. And I think it, you know, it, um, it would be wrong to imply that the spontaneous rewilding and the return of wolves to much of Central Europe isn't without problems. I think there are some issues there, increasingly yeah. kind of human wildlife conflicts. And um, maybe another call would be good to get Erwin on to talk about that experience, particularly from a Netherlands perspective, which is kind of one of the most highly urbanized, densely populated countries in the world where there are now wolves, albeit in, in limited numbers. So I think there's there's some really interesting stuff coming out of Europe in terms of, I suppose, that kind of coexistence, essentially. Um, but yeah, I think I think the spontaneous rewilding is is really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, we've had um, quite an exciting time in locked down i mean trapped in trapped in our little area of london just looking for wildlife and there i think there is quite a lot of spontaneous rewilding happening even in in the urban environment so we've seen peregrine falcons we've seen loads of you know uh, uh, uh loads of woodpeckers we've seen kingfishers i mean it's surprising and they they you know i mean some people have devoted some time to making small places for nature but the peregrine falcons are just living on top of a a church, which is yeah, it's really cool. And I think Lizzie, that you know, um, one of the questions around rewilding is, it, uh, can I do anything myself in my garden or in my street to uh, for rewilding? Yeah. Is is that possible? You preempted me because that was my next question. What can you know? That's <laughs> finished. I know what can people do. Is there anything that if you don't own a bit large bit of land, what can you do? And I think the, the things that you've just been talking about um, can really help with that with connectivity. So it's about creating the corridors, maybe again for small mammals or from invertebrates, which can then be, become part of a much more integrated kind of system. So, you know, it's not possible to fully rewild your back garden or even a street of back gardens because you're not going to get the full level of troughing directions. Um, unless you particularly want to have a lynx or a wolf in your back garden, but you can start to create pathways and 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 uh, corridors for other species to be able to c connect. Um, so it, it can be really important. And you know, we've, I suppose, it, we 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 always say from a rewilding thematic group perspective that it's not just about wolves and lynx. Let's get let's step back from this. And all we've kind of talked about this afternoon are wolves and lynx, or not all, but we've talked a lot about wolves and lynx. But so that kind of thing that you're talking about is really important, Lizzie. Anybody yeah. else rewilding their back garden? Sally, have you got anything? Um, no. <laughs> just moved and my garden's full of concrete. So yes, eventually we'll get to rewilding it. But <laughs> but yeah, just to say that it's not just about the like not just about the ecological restoration. And if people want to do something, consider the cultural change that's necessary for rewilding and perhaps promote or um, uh, support more sustainable land uses, for example, or businesses that uh, are more um, kind of approaching things more sustainably. Yeah, that's yeah, that's really. Yeah, that's really right. Um, Adam, have you got any tips for for small scale 
amateur rewilders? Well, I don't think it's just the question of, um, you know, people that have got access to land. You don't need to have access to any land at all to help with the overall effort. I mean, you know, get involved in something like the Wild Side project, you know, getting involved in a movement um, engaging with and connecting with wildlife is a fantastic thing to do. And in doing that and in going to places where there is wildlife and spending your money there, you know, going on holiday, for example, um, you you are indirectly supporting uh, the restoration of wild areas and, and the ultimate protection of them by helping to give them a, you know, a firm economic value that those local stakeholders that may or may not like the idea of rewilding can see and benefit from. I know that's kind of an anthropocentric angle, but but it's important and it it will help to achieve rewilding projects if local stakeholders are, are standing to gain something from them. Um, yeah. And uh, learn more about ecology. I think there's a real lack of ecological education in, in our school system. And so just learn about how we interact and how we um, rely on other species. Mm. I saw that, 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 um, um, that there's, is there a new GCSE in uh, ecology? I don't know whether there's a whole movement to try and push that forward. Are you, you're smiling as if that is true, yeah. Uh, maybe, I don't know. It's I'm been smiling because I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's been talked about for a long time. And again, it's one of the things which came out of the Das Gupta review that there should be um, uh, much more integration of, of natural history into the school curriculum. I think Das Gupta talks about secondary school, but I think it should run from primary school all the way through. And whether that's in a more play based approach through forest schools or whatever at the primary level through to perhaps a GCSE or A level. Um, I think it's 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 you know it, it it has to become part of the school system, and we ha we have to start working with the next generation because they they're not going to protect what they don't understand or haven't experienced. So nature's got to become part of their everyday. Mm, even for people in the deepest cities. Um, there's a final question um, that I missed in the in the uh, chat, which is um, within the UK, will rewilding be pioneered within privately owned land or in publicly owned land? That sounds like an easy one to finish on. <laughs> Ian, would you like to take that question? Sorry, you're on the screen. <laughs> Uh, it's probably a better question for Adam, actually, I think, but I'm happy to talk to it if Adam's <laughs> wanting. No, I'm happy to. Um, so, I mean, both is is the kind of initial obvious answer, but there's a lot of privately owned land in the UK, so there's there's a huge opportunity there. A lot of work is being done on privately owned land, um, but with support, um, or hopefully in the future, with more and more support from, for example, public subsidies, uh, you know, changes in agricultural subsidies. So it may not be the land that's provided from the public side, but um, it, it can be support for making it happen on the private land. But but equally, you know, public land, absolutely. Um, you know, that that is ideal if we can do it both public and private, um, that there's plenty of parts of the UK that where there's public ownership where it can be championed as well. So I think it's really, you know, it, there's not so much a split, I wouldn't say between the private and public owned land. Um, I think it's, you know, all and any, wherever opportunities arise, essentially. Yeah, I think there's definitely an interest across all. Um, it seems to be happening happening right now more on privately owned land, um, but and there's some barriers to rewilding happening more in publicly owned land. Um, quite complex issues around land use, um, but I think there's a lot of public interest in rewilding, and that's pushing places like the Lake District National Park and organisations like the National Trust to really consider rewilding the f in the future. Yeah, cool. Um, Ian, have you got anything to add to that? If you, if you don't, you, there's no, no problem. I, I, I think Adam and Sally have, have responded to that, that one. Great. And can I jump uh, in with one final comment? Uh, yes. Which is, which is just um, be our final comment. So have you got anything? I feel so that we um, have a quarter piece. <laughs> we focused heavily on carnivores when talking about species, which is wrong of us. Um, obviously, they're very important and lots of them are keystone species. But just to go back to your question, Lizzie, uh, you know, what species, if everyone wanted it to happen, would I, you know, want to see back in the UK? I actually really like the European elk, which is essentially the moose for those that, that don't know um, what that is. And yeah, I just think it's a really cool animal, this big lumbering beast uh, that we could theoretically have back in the UK at some point. Uh, so yeah, if everyone supported that, I'd be all in on the European elk. 
it's a it's a surprisingly uh controversial choice adam actually um, i know so... <laughs> but yeah just to remind you ian you did say wolves speaking of <laughs> 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 I wasn't advocating wolves. I was just kind of raising it as an interesting uh, area for conversation, Lizzie. That's what I repeat that point. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, thanks to you all for for giving your time, and thanks to everybody for for dialing in as attendees um, and participating in the questions. It's I think it's been a really great, broad ranging, thought provoking discussion, and hopefully just the first of many. So, um, as I said at the beginning, there is. Um, you'll get communications about the next event, um, which I think is either next month or shortly afterwards. Um, but please come along and please, if you've got any questions that either I've missed in, and not asked, or you've got any questions that occur to you afterwards, please do um, send them to the to the inbox and, and people I'm sure will be happy to get back. Um, but yeah, I think I'll, I'll do, we'll do a like virtual round of applause, but thank you very much to everybody and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you, Lizzie. Thanks, and thanks everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.